Um, so today I'm going to introduce some of the economic perspectives on the nexus and specifically concepts and terminology from economics that are commonly used to, in discussions about the environment. And this is my first time teaching this class in person, so please bear with me through any glitches. There are a couple eye clicker questions, so please be ready to answer those as well. Um, and one quick question, is the volume too loud? Can you raise your hands if yes? It's good. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So today I'm going to start by asking why the free market, which is at least in theory a powerful mechanism for allocating scarce resources, fails when it comes to protecting the environment, to ensuring equity and inclusion, or securing the planet for future generations. Um, so today I'll start by briefly introducing what a market economy is, the core notion of equilibrium and efficiency used by economists, and the difference between efficiency and equity. The majority of the class will then be dedicated to understanding why the market fails when it comes to protecting the environment. To do this, I'll introduce various concepts that economists use to describe environmental and social dilemmas. And finally, if we have time, we'll briefly speak about some of the more common economic policy mechanisms for addressing climate change. And if we don't have time today, we'll come to this um, in the next lecture. Okay, so economic systems describe different models for how economic activities or the product, production and distribution of goods and services are organized in a society. They involve people, institutions, this can include informal institutions like social norms and formal rules of conduct, and social relations that govern how uh, property rights are governed um, and management structures. Um, they vary in how decisions are made and which, which objectives are maximized. So for example, decisions can be more or less centralized or coordinated by governments, which maps onto the ends of the spectrums that you see here. In centrally planned or command economies on, on your, where is this? Your, on your right, on your left, um, a government body owns the factors of production. So this is land, capital, other resources and decides how much should be produced and at what prices. And so macroeconomic and political considerations often determine resource allocation in these kinds of economies. In decentralized free market economies, on your right, um, these uh, outcomes are unplanned and emerge from the exchange between many private and competing owners and consumers. And profits and losses, which depend on consumer prefer preferences and resource availability, um, determine how much is produced and what the prices of those goods and services are. So these co uncoordinated exchanges are called the market. And the space in between these two poles are called mixed economies. And so all these are kind of um, ideal or kind of theoretical ends of the spectrum. All economies fall somewhere in between. The US falls somewhere towards the market economy side of the spectrum. It's a market system where private firms own the means of production. But there's also large public sector involvement, for example, in um, education, in health services for seniors, um, in national defense. OK. So the free market economy was first proposed by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, um, in, published in 1776. And you might have seen this quote in one of Professor Nixon's earlier classes or mention of the Wealth of Nations. Um, but I'm going to read this quote again, um, which says that it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Um, so Adam Smith also uh, famously uh, came up with the metaphor, the invisible hand in the Wealth of Nations, um, which is a metaphor that captures the sort of organization of this decentralized economy. And in this quote, he's making the point that a decentralized market system composed of small private actors can reach an efficient equilibrium simply through the self-interested actions of each individual. And so we'll hear this appeal to self-interest come up several times today, and we'll discuss this assumption in subsequent classes. Of course, um, Smith's pure free market is an abstraction, but it's one that continues to hold rhetorical and political weight in the US, where many people place high value on individual and corporate freedom, arguing for policies of deregulation and low taxation. OK, 
Okay, so the market economy, through the process of decentralized exchange, handles resource allocation surprisingly well. Um, so returning to Adam Smith's quote, you can imagine an economy full of people with different endowments or things. They can consume their endowments or they can sell or trade them for items they prefer. The market is a way to organize all those trades and the way it does this is through the price mechanism. Okay, so if you've ever taken an introductory economics class, you've likely seen a, fi a figure similar to this one. So this figure shows the relationship between supply, demand, and prices in a market economy. Supply and demand curves contain important information about costs and benefits. So the y-axis here shows increasing prices. The x-axis shows increasing quantity of a good produced. The demand curve reflects the value of a good to consumers as measured by the prices they're willing to pay for items. The supply curve reflects the cost of producing a good. And you can see that the supply of a good is increasing in, in the price that it can earn, while demand is decreasing in price. In absence of, the gov of government intervention, the price adjusts to balance the supply and demand for a good. And this leads to uh, market clearing equilibrium, which is here, the point of intersection of the two lines. At the equilibrium point, the cost of production is minimized and utility is maximized. Okay, so I mentioned the price mechanism as a sort of coordinating device in a market economy. Um, so Hayek was an economist who's maybe best known for founding the Austrian school and being a staunch libertarian. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for his theory of price as a communication technology that facilitates kind of spontaneous order in decentralized societies. And so he wrote about this in a 1948 piece called The Use of Knowledge in Society. I'm gonna read a quote from this now. The price system is a kind of machinery for registering change or a system of telecommunications, which enables individual producers to watch merely the movement of a few pointers. The marvel is that in the case of a scarcity of one raw material, without an order being issued, without more than perhaps a handful of people knowing the cause, tens of thousands of people whose identity could not be ascertained by months of investigation are made to use the materials or its products more sparingly. Um, so this is a description of the kind of uh, spontaneous coordination <laughs> that price signals allow um, across you know, long distances and uh, many, many small decisions um, made by decentralized actors. Okay, so to summarize, in a market equilibrium, is this? okay, in a market equilibrium, Supply equals demand, which means that the market clears. We don't have shortages, we don't have oversupply. Total production cost is minimized, and efficiency, at least in the allocation of resources, is achieved. And the core notion that economists use for efficiency is Pareto efficiency, or Pareto optimality. So Pareto optimality is a situation where it's not possible to change the allocation of resources in a way that makes someone better off <laughs> without at the same time making someone else worse off. Um, so no more trade will happen once the, once the system has re reached Pareto efficiency. Um, so while efficiency is guaranteed um, in a free market economy, at least one that meets certain assumptions that we'll discuss ne next, equity is not. So while no one's worse off with trade than without because they can always choose not to trade, some may benefit more than others. The market can produce a distribution of goods and services where a few have a lot and the rest have very little. It has no built-in mechanism to correct for differences in initial endowments or resource allocation and can exacerbate structural racism, perpetuate historical inequalities, um, and corrective mechanisms, for example, the redistribution of resources through taxation or other means like reparations might be necessary if the aim is to maximize social welfare objectives, so objectives other than efficiency. Okay. So the, on the previous slide, I said that efficiency is guaranteed, but that's only true under relatively stringent assumptions that are often violated in practice. Um, so for example, uh, or let, let me go through the assumption. So perfect competition or no market power is the condition that no actor can single-handedly affect the price of a good. They're all price takers. The other assumptions are that there's full information. Um, so uh, that's equally and freely available to all actors. 
that markets are complete, so all actors can trade with all other actors. This, this is called all trades are contractable, and um, that everyone has access to the market. So it's pretty easy to think of violations of most of these assumptions. Um, so Amazon, for example, for the last decade or maybe longer, has been in and out of the spotlight for predatory pricing. They and other companies, also like Uber and Airbnb, have been accused of suppressing or deflating prices of goods below their costs in order to gain market shares and push other retailers out of, out of the market. So this violates the notion of no market power when these firms get very large, where they, they're affecting the prices. Um, can anyone think of any other examples of violations of any of these assumptions? No. OK. Uh, we'll come to one on the, on the next slide. There, once you start noticing them, there are many, many, many around. Um, but, but the language is kind of technical, so it's maybe hard to um, pinpoint them. OK, so even when, when these assumptions hold, efficiency doesn't guarantee equity. Um, and a market can improve welfare, but how much can vary, uh, resulting in inequalities. So labor markets can reduce inequalities in income, but not in wealth. And under imperfect competitions, uh, co sorry, imperfect conditions, so conditions that violate the assumptions on the previous slide, inequalities can increase. So an example of this is uh, loans, um, preferential loans for higher in income individuals, which can exacerbate uh, inequalities. Um, and this can result in some people becoming very rich um, and others having very little. And I think in the interest of time, I'll actually skip this. But this link is just a visualization of Jeff Bezos' wealth. And it's a graphical visualization that's really compelling. It really gives you a sense of these quantities. OK. So the market economy, through the process of decentralized exchange, handles resource allocation surprisingly well. But the environment is not well handled by the market economy. And we're going to spend the rest of the class trying to understand why. Um, I also just wanted to, to raise uh, various criticisms of both planned and market economies. So planned economies don't have this price signal, um, and so can end up with shortages and surpluses. They also necessarily curtail some individual freedoms and um, situate decision power with government officials. Markets, on the other hand, uh, also concentrate pow power in the owners of capital. Um, and this can lead to inequality. And the primary objective of market systems is not ensuring equitable distribution of wealth, but rather the efficient distribution of resources. And um, markets, market systems are sometimes unable to respond to major recessions, for example, through expansive monetar monetary policy to stimulate the economy, which moves an economy more towards the planned economy side of the scale, where there's a lot of government intervention. And so why, why am I talking about this right now? This is important in the wake of the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the growing realization of the kind of scale um, of coordination of uh, decision making and spending that will be needed to reach a net zero economy. Um, so in light of that, there's been renewed debate in the US about both the role and size of government, and also changing sentiments about the kind of desired uh, role of government. OK, so market failures create an inefficient distribution of goods. Um, and this is normally when the government steps in. And this can happen for various reasons. So it can happen because um, the assumptions that we mentioned on the previous page are uh, violated. It can also happen because of particular, um, particular types of problems that create kinds of social dilemmas. And we'll speak about those in more detail. And so market failures characterize many of the environmental problems we discuss in the nexus. Um, and they're illustrated in this following quote by Nicholas Stern, or this, this kind of uh, link between market failures and climate change. Climate change is a result of the greatest market failure the world has seen. The evidence on the seriousness of the risks from inaction or delayed action is now overwhelming. The problem of climate change involves a fundamental failure of markets. Those who damage others by emitting greenhouse gases generally do not pay. Um, and this is a quote from the report on the economics of climate change. Nicholas Stern is a very well-known climate economist. Um, and it's also ec echoed in this 
pithier quote by science fiction author Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson, who says, when it comes to the environment, the invisible hand of the market never picks up the check. Of course, there are other perspectives. For example, in this quote by Republican politician um, Ron Paul, he says, the freer the market and the more respect you have for private property, the better the environment is protected. So market failures, again, can happen because of the violations of the assumptions we discussed earlier or because of features of a particular good or problem, and we'll discuss these. They can also happen because of implicit markets like lobbying efforts um, and, and things like that. And we'll also discuss those in, I think, the next class or the one after. Okay, so before we get into the types of environmental dilemmas and social dilemmas, um, or the, the way that economists describe these kinds of environmental dilemmas, we're gonna start by playing a game. And so this is going to involve an eye clicker response. Um, so without discussing with your neighbors, please use your eye clicker to select between the following two, two options. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let me go through the two options. In there are only two, so please only choose, use um, the choices A or B. In choice A, you get X dollars, where X is equal to the number of other students in the room who clicked A. In choice B, you get X dollars as well, plus a bonus of $10. Okay. Mm. Okay. That didn't here. Doesn't work. Oh. Okay, it's going. Okay. Okay, five seconds. That's all? Oh, stop first, okay. 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 So, can everyone see, yes, you see this. Okay, so 58% of you chose A, and 50% chose B. Um, this actually might be a slightly more cooperative class, surprisingly, than, than the one last year. Um, okay, so let's go through, um, how do I move the, just click here, okay. And then should I leave this here? Is it okay to leave it there? Okay. Okay, so A is the cooperative choice, and B we're gonna call the, the defector, or non-cooperative choice. Um, and so let's go over this game. So this might not be, you've probably heard of a prisoner's dilemma. This probably isn't the typical version that you've heard, which involves two prisoners trying to negotiate their release. But this is another version of it that creates the same kind of social dilemma. So this game's called a prisoner's dilemma because of Albert Tucker, who was here at Princeton at the time. But it was created at, RAND, it was developed at RAND and a lot of uh, game theory, these kind of stylized representations of strategic dilemmas uh, were also developed during this time, at, a lot of them at Princeton and also at RAND. Um, so these games are abstractions of social situations or strategic decisions that show how conflicts of interest can arise between individuals and the group, the collective outcome, especially when it's difficult to coordinate your choices. Okay, so let's walk through how this game works. So let's say there are 100 students in this class. Um, I think that's approximately what we had. If everyone selected A, then everyone would, would get $100. If there were five defectors who chose B, then those who selected A would now all earn $95, and everyone who selected A would suffer as a result of those five defectors. But those five defectors would earn 95, um, the number of people that selected A, plus the bonus of 10. So they, they would actually benefit. They'd be doing better. But only up to a point. So for example, if we had 20 people choosing B, then those who chose A would earn 80, they'd still be doing worse, and those who chose B would now earn 90. So they'd be doing worse than if everyone had chosen A. Right, so we can see that the individual interests to select B and get the bonus 
works against the interest that all others select A and against the socially optimal outcome. The value of selecting B is also decreasing in the number of defectors because they can no longer sort of benefit from the cooperators. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So let's try this again. These make a choice between A and B. Okay. Oh, oops, I didn't stop it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So <laughs> it's always interesting to see how much it shifts um, once you teach people the kind of rules of the game, even though I think people implicitly understand once it becomes common knowledge that those who select B are defecting or not choosing the cooperative option, you end up with a lot more people choosing A, um, the cooperative option. But we still have 36% of the class here choosing B, uh, which means that we're not achieving the socially optimal value, and both the A's and the B's are suffering as a result. Um, so of course, this is a stylized game that differs from the social dilemmas in the real world in many ways. Uh, can anyone name some potentially important differences um, from a real world social dilemma like this? Yep. Yes. Anyone else? Yep. I, I see. OK, so that's, I think that's sort of similar in a, ray, in a way, right? This idea of differential kind of power in this game. That's, that's a good point, and I think one we should keep in mind as we discuss the relevance of this for the environmental dilemmas that we're talking about. OK, so there are other, um, so those, those are really important ones. Um, there are other kind of simpler ones, um, which are that these payments are hypothetical. So of course, this isn't a real stakes game. In the real world, the stakes are real. Um, you know, uh, climate change uh, for many is uh, high cost and at worst a life or death, life or death kind of situation. Um, this is a one-shot game, which means that it's not repeated with the same people over time. You guys played it once here, but in the real world, many of these kinds of social dilemmas, these negotiations about whether to contribute to the group or not, are repeated over time, often in communities, but also between international actors. And so there's time to learn about the reputations of individuals and to build trust. Um, your choice here is anonymous, so I don't have your name next to your choice. If I had your name or your picture next to your choice, that might make you think twice about selecting B. Um, there's also no possibility for communicating with each other before making a choice. I mean, here you could have agreed with your neighbor to cooperate, but as, as a group, you know, there wasn't a situation where you guys all decided, OK, let's cooperate and choose A, and does everyone agree to do this? Um, which, you know, in, in the real world, of, of course, people are able to communicate. Um, so these are all factors that have been shown to change the outcome of the game towards more cooperation. There's also an assumption in these games, which is that people act in their own economic self-interest. So you're making the choice that will maximize your own profits, in which case B sometimes makes sense if that's, if that's what you're trying to maximize. But research shows that people also value the well-being of others. People often have pro-social preferences. And so they're trying to maximize the social good. And in that case, choosing A is going to lead to a bigger total um, sum of earnings. And Actually, the first time this game was played, it was played with uh, secretaries at RAND who were given the game, and they all cooperated. Um, and despite that, the theory says that people will not. Um, OK. OK, so as a society, we can also set up institutions to govern behavior when we encounter these types of dilemmas. Um, for example, social sanctions or ostracism, social ostracism, so knowing that people defect, you can kind of keep them out of your group or you can you know, ignore them for a day. And, and those kinds of uh, social mechanisms are very common in small group dilemmas. But there are also price mechanisms or legal action that can all change the outcome in the game. 
Um, so let's see which type of intervention you prefer. Uh, let me close this. Um, so please vote for one of the following rules. For rule one, which says that selecting A is compulsory in the society, please choose A. For rule two, which says that selecting B will incur a fine, the bonus gets reduced from $10 to $3, please choose B. And for rule three, um, where selecting, selecting B now incurs a super fine, the bonus is reduced from 10 to negative $5, you actually get penalized for choosing B. Five more seconds. OK. Let's see. OK. So most people here would create a society um, where it, selecting B incurs a super fine. Um, so it's 58% of the class. Um, and that actually makes a lot of sense, because what rule three does is it makes people internalize the consequences of their actions on others, so that the private interests become aligned with the public interests. Um, so it, it changes the profitability of choosing B. Rule two still leaves a little bit of profitability, but reduces it. Rule one is more similar to a, a mandate or regulation, whereas the other ones are more comparable to kind of market-based mechanisms because they internalize the costs and change the price. Interesting how few of you would choose A, though, I think. I mean, selecting the A is compulsory. OK, so this game you just played is a collective action problem. This is a situation in which all individuals would be better off if they all coordinated, but they fail to do so. And this can be because of conflicting interests, but doesn't need to be because of conflicting interests. So there are two kinds of collective action problems. There are coordination problems. These are problems where everyone would like to uh, coordinate on an action. Everyone would be better off if they did. But it's hard to identify which action to coordinate on, or there are other costs to choosing that action. Um, so the, an example there is technology adoption. So for example, the choice of which social media platform to use. A social media platform is only useful if a critical mass of people, the critical mass that you're interested in communicating with, is also on that platform. Otherwise, it's not a useful platform. That takes coordination. Um, another example is the adoption of electric vehicles where uh, charging stations are, um, are worthwhile to build only if enough people in many locations, only if enough people adopt electric vehicles. And so once you have a critical mass, it becomes easier for everyone to adopt, but you need people to coordinate on this kind of new technology. Um, the other kind of collective action problem is similar to the game you just played, and this is where there are conflicting individual and collective interests. Um, these sorts of social dilemmas can create a free rider problem, and I mentioned this earlier, but for the sake of giving you the full definition, these are individuals who benefit from the cooperation of others that act in their own self-interest. And these are common in contexts with public goods. Um, and these are often contexts um, with externalities, which we'll talk about next. OK. So many of the environmental dilemmas we'll discuss in this course have the characteristics of some type of collective action problem, often a prisoner's dilemma. But the precise nature of the problem can differ. And so we'll spend the next bit of class going through some common features of environmental problems. Okay, so the first one are externalities. So air pollution is the classic example in economics of a negative externality. Externalities happen when the production or consumption of a good or service impacts a third party that's not involved in the transaction <coughs> without this being reflected in the price um, of the good. So Externalities can affect people. For example, someone else's loud music or party can be my noise or keep me up at night. Um, but it can also happen at the level of society. Um, and they can also be positive or negative. So can anyone think, so there are many examples of negative externalities that people often talk about. Can anyone think of an example of a positive externality? And this is a situ, yes, please. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah. Route. But that's how is that a that's a negative externality, right? Okay, 
is that, can you think of an example of a positive one? It's difficult, because they're not often talked about. Yes, yes, OK. Sharing a Netflix password is a good example. On a broader kind of societal level, you can also think of uh, education as a positive externality, because education confers a private benefit to you, but it also increases the kind of knowledge base in society and increases the uh, quality of the workforce in a society. And research and development is another one, which is why it's often subsidized by the government. Um, and pollution is the most common example of a negative externality. So the social costs of pollution to a society are not included in the private cost, or often aren't including, included in the private cost of producing a good. And these social costs can be immediate health impacts of polluted water systems, for example, or the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions on future generations or current generations. Another way to see this is by returning to our supply and demand curve. Um, so here, if the smoke created by a factory is a risk, health risk <laughs> for those who breathe the air, that would be a negative externality. Um, and the reason this is is because buyers and sellers neglect these external effects of their actions, so they don't take into account the social cost of this action. Um, when, uh, in, and this isn't, the social cost isn't reflected in, so this is a situation where the social cost is not reflected in the demand and uh, supply um, or the market equilibrium. Okay, um, so in these situations, the good is overproduced relative to the socially efficient equilibrium because it only reflects, reflects the private costs of production. The externality means that the cost to society, which includes the cost to bystanders and private costs, is not reflected. Once it is reflected, the demand, the supply curve shifts up. And what this means is that um, the supply curve, the optimal amount produced at any pri given price decreases as a result. So a tax on the pollutant is one way of increasing the cost to private producers. And a, a tax on the pollutant that's equal to the social cost would bring the equilibrium up to the socially efficient uh, equilibrium. And at the socially efficient equilibrium, you would have less of the good produced because it's now costlier to produce and to consume. When costs aren't internalized by the market, they can create a prisoner's dilemma. So again, this is a different way of depicting the game that you guys played. This depiction is the more common one in economics. Um, so this is a payoff matrix um, that describes the decisions of whether to pollute or not. So here, this is an abstraction. It's a world with two firms. This can be generalized to a world with many firms. And these firms face two decisions, whether to pollute or abate. And there are two firms, one in the row position and one in the column position. OK. Um, so the way to read these payoff matrices is that the first uh, number here reflects the profit a firm one when they choose, for example, to pollute, and firm two is polluting. So they get one, and firm two would get one. So that's, that's the way you read these. And so what we can see here is that the decision to abate and abate would maximize the profits overall. This would be a society where the profits total to four. However, what we also see from this payoff matrix, and I'll walk you through this, is that the Nash equilibrium is the decision pollute, pollute. And the reason this is, is that in a Nash equilibrium, a firm is best responding to what another firm is doing. So if we take the position of firm one, we're firm one, we're trying to decide whether to pollute or abate, and we have firm two here. Let's assume that firm two is polluting. If firm two is polluting, then we can abate and earn zero while they earn three, or we can pollute and earn one while they earn one. If we're trying to maximize our own profits, we're better off polluting. Okay, now let's assume firm two is abating. If they're abating, we can abate and earn two, or we can pollute and earn three. So again, we're better off polluting. So regardless of what the other firm does, the self-interested or profit-maximizing option for firm one is to pollute. Right, so this creates a prisoner's dilemma, where you end up with pollute, pollute, even though the socially beneficial outcome would be abate, abate. 
So this kind of uh, externality, um, so for the externality of polluting, can be addressed through many private and public solutions, which we'll discuss uh, at the end of class if we have time and otherwise next class. Okay. Another way to speak about goods um, that is used by economists to characterize many environmental dilemmas is using dimensions of excludabi excludability and rivalry. And this differentiates common goods from uh, common pool resource problems from public goods. And we'll speak about those two next. So an excludable good is a good where a person can be prevented from using the good. A rivalrous good is where one person's use of the good diminishes another person's ability to use it. Um, so there, if we take all combinations of these two, we can come up with different types of goods. And economists have referred to these as private goods. Those are excludable and rival. Common resources, these are rival but not excludable. So my use diminishes your use, but I can't exclude you from using the good. Public goods, which are neither excludable nor rival, so my use does not diminish your enjoyment, and I can't exclude you from using it. And natural monopolies, which are excludable but not rival. Um, and so today, we're going to focus just on common resources and public goods. There are many examples of common resource problems across the nexus. These include over-harvesting of fish. Um, in international waters, for example, it's hard to exclude people um, from harvesting fish, but what I take is something that's, not, that's no longer there for someone else to access. Other examples are uh, deforestation, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, um, plastics in the ocean. And the challenge of managing these sorts of resources has been famously called the tragedy of the commons. So the tragedy of the commons comes from an essay <laughs> written by Garrett Hardin in 1968 by the same name. And he describes the commons as a the tragedy of the commons as a rivalrous, non-excludable, and commonly used resource that could be maintained, gets overconsumed because people act in their own self-interest at the expense of the collective good. So Hardin takes the example of shared grazing land in the UK to illustrate that people without external enforcement or the introduction of private property will end up overexploiting the commons. And in his telling of this, this is inevitable because even if the commons is manageable in theory at a certain rate of use, when a good is rivalrous, there's an incentive for an individual to use it quickly because they can benefit a little bit more by taking a little bit more today and they don't know that other people aren't doing this. So you end up with this uh, competitive use of the commons. Um, and again, in economics, these are called common pool resource problems. And you, I'm sure that everyone here has come across this. I just, when I was looking um, up some stats on tragedy of uh, the tragedy of the commons, I saw that uh, on the open syllabus project, this is one of the most assigned essays in university syllabi sort of across disciplines um, over the past 10 years. And it's been cited over 40,000 times. And it's a concept that's important in environmental science and policymaking. However, uh, I do want to note, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, that both the idea and Hardin himself have been heavily criticized. Um, so on the left, this is an article about, uh, that sort of problematizes Hardin's position. So Hardin was a racist, he used his theory to defend nativist, anti-immigration, and eugenicist policies. Um, he lobbied Congress against sending food to poor nations because he was worried about overpopulation. And he has this dubious position called lifeboat ethics to defend these, these arguments. Um, and the essay itself, The Tragedy of the Commons, is a very problematic uh, essay itself, um, if, you've, if you've read it. Um, his essay has also been criticized on various more uh, academic grounds. So one prominent criticism comes from the historian Susan J. Buck Cox, who says uh, that there's actually no, she calls it, her essay is no tragedy on the commons. And she discusses how Hardin actually misrepresented the commons, um, what the commons were. So these were actually pastures that were well managed for years. And then the ownership structure was changed. And a the ownership of the commons was concentrated in the hands of a few smaller landholders. Um, and the kind of rules of use of the commons changed. And this is what led to the abuse of the commons. So she ends her essay with the following kind of optimistic quote. Perhaps what existed in fact was not a tragedy of the commons, but rather a triumph, that for hundreds of years land was managed successfully by communities. 
And this finding that communities are able to manage at least local commons is something that uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize for. This was the first uh, Nobel Prize in economics to go to a woman, and only one of two that have been awarded to a woman, with a recent one awarded to Esther Duflo maybe two years ago. Um, so Eleanor Ostrom uh, studied many small communities um, of uh, foresters and fisheries and found that communities manage uh, the use of the commons by establishing institutions that facilitate cooperation. So these can be informal institutions by setting up, uh, establishing social norms of cooperation and clear kind of sanctions for people that don't cooperate. Um, but also uh, through the use of more explicit rules and mechanisms to monitor and enforce these rules. She also found that when people make decisions about resource use but are insulated from the immediate impacts, the immediate environmental impacts, for example, through markets, um, this can lead to more environmental damages. Um, so most of her work was on local commons, but she also did write about global commons, which are very challenging. So while people are able to manage local commons, global commons like the oceans and the atmosphere are very difficult to manage. Um, and she has interesting ideas about governance structures that can facilitate that, that we will hopefully be able to discuss in a subsequent class. OK. Um, so we're going to get through public goods and intertemporal problems. We're not going to get to the policy mechanisms today. We'll start with that next class. So another characteristic of many environmental problems is that they're public goods. Um, so they're similar to common resource problems because public goods are non-excludable. Um, they're public or commonly owned resources. And so other people's, people's use cannot be, uh, I am unable to exclude other people from using it. Firms are unable to exclude people from uh, using resources that, that they produce, for example. And unlike common resource problems, public goods or bads are non-rival they can be simultaneously consumed by many people, for example, like sunshine. Um, and that's the little cartoon on the bottom is sort of a, a play on this concept. Um, other examples are biodiversity or national parks, which are often considered public goods because my enjoyment doesn't reduce your enjoyment, barring uh, kind of, or ignoring overcrowding issues and things like that. Um, and also, neither of us can be excluded from the benefits. Another example is present, preventing the ozone hole. So everyone benefits from this, whether they contribute or not. So these features, the non-rivalrous nature and the non-excludable nature of public goods problems, means that the supply of public goods are not easily amenable to market forces. And so they're often undersupplied because the supply of these goods, it's difficult to reward since people can't, since there's no kind of private property, people can't be excluded from them. Um, the government, of course, can provide public goods and often does. Um, and you know, they often do a cost-benefit calculation. And if the benefits exceed the cost, they'll provide a public good, which makes everyone better off. And so, for example, national defense um, is an example of a public good, public education. OK. OK, so a final feature that comes up often in economic discussions of environmental dilemmas is that many of these problems require uh, costly benefits today, costly, sorry, costly actions today for benefits that happen down the road, for deferred benefits. And similarly, inaction today can lead to costs or impacts that happen down the road. So there's this complicated intertemporal dimension to these problems. Um, so an intertemporal problem in general is one where there is sequential arrival of users so you can have an intertemporal problem that is in your own lifetime, deciding what to consume or save now for future consumption. But there are also intergenerational problems. And this is the kind of problem we're more interested in in this class and in thinking about climate change. And this is when you have sequential arrivals of new users and, and, or new people. Um, and these are generations. And you also have exhaustible resources. So uh, for example, um, exhaustible uh, fish resources in the ocean. Um, and also when the impacts of use today are delayed. So you can cons over consume now and not necessarily feel the impacts, but future generations will be feeling these impacts. So this creates a mismatch of incentives that's similar to an intertemporal uh, 
um, prisoner's dilemma game. So if early generations are selfish or myopic, they may exhaust resources and pass on a more difficult problem to future generations. And this idea of intergenerational justice has become a central message of many global climate movements, including the Fridays for Future movement started by Greta Thunberg. OK, and this, I'll stop um, on this slide. So intertemporal problems have also been conceptualized as a prisoner's dilemma in time and also studied in this way empirically. So in these games, rather than these simultaneous decisions, what happens is that a community of resource users makes decisions about resource use, and they can maximize their own profits, or they can leave resources in this collective pot to pass on to the next generation. And so you see this uh, trade-off between the individual incentives of this group today and the incentives of the next generation. In these games, the next generation are subsequent participants in a game. So that's how it's operationalized in these games. And what the authors find is that there are democratic institutions that can help cooperation over time, but only if you have enough people who care about the well-being of future generations. OK, um, I'll stop on this for today, and I'll pick up with the policy mechanisms on Friday. Thank you.